How did a photographer from the Smithsonian become a professional organizer? We'll find out today on Keeping You Organized. Well, joining us is Janine Sarna Jones, and uh, she's out in New York today, uh, probably every day, because that's where you're uh, located, <laughs> correct? Exactly, yes. And, and you're from, uh, it's organizeme.info is your website, but you're, uh, you've been involved, you've got kind of a, a, a nice history of professional organizi organizing, and you've been involved with uh, the NAPO chapter out there in New York uh, for quite yes. a while. But uh, let's start back a little earlier and kind of talk about uh, kind of how you started maybe out of college, what you did, and what led you into the uh, organizing profession. Well, I used to be a photographer. I studied photography in college. Mm -hmm. And my first job out of college was working for the Smithsonian, the Museum of the American Indian. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the, it had just become part of the Smithsonian. So there was stuff that was in the office for, I don't know how long, from the 60s, I think. And wow. I asked if I could organize. And when I was done, my boss referred me to somebody who needed some help with her home office. So I basically started off organizing at the same time. Now let me go go back to like maybe your high school days or your junior high days. Did you have, were you one of the kids that had like the organized room or was it kind of a mess? Because <laughs> <laughs> I have kids that, I have one that's of each. So, you know, <laughs> one's really organized and one's a big mess. So. <laughs> well, I, I think as a younger person, I struggled with perfectionism. Uh -huh. um, so. I recently, it's funny, you you mentioned those days, because I recently went through old notebooks that were in my parents' attic, and I could see in my handwriting, you know, I, I would rip pages out if I made a mistake on a word and mm -hmm. rewrite it. So my notes were very neat, and um, I don't, I wasn't the kind of, I love to reorganize my room, things like that, but I wasn't a anal freak about <laughs> like I would drop things on the floor and and things like that but I do realize one of the things that I was missing as a youngster was bookshelves and my ah. parents never you know it never occurred to them to get me bookshelves so I did have things that were stacked up but it was because I had no place to put them right. and I didn't realize that there were there was a way to fix things like that well, so let's go back to the Smithsonian. You got the one client. You got referred to a few others. Uh, when did you decide to take the leap away from uh, the Smithsonian uh, Institute and getting into uh, just professional organizing full-time? That's kind of a leap, isn't it? I, I would say it's a bit of a leap. But my department, the photo department, moved down to Maryland, and I am not a Washingtonian. <laughs> I, could never, I could never live there, I don't think. I, it, it was... Um, and I really wasn't in love with photography like I'd been as a younger person. Um, and I, I think truly at the end of the day when I thought about it, I felt like the photography that I wasn't doing wasn't really having an impact on the world or on people. And I am one of those people that I believe that part of our job here on earth is to make it better for other people. Right. And I wasn't able to do that with photography and I realized and when I was organizing people that you know their whole lives would change they mm -hmm. would be all excited and they would feel better about their space about themselves and and I, I really do believe that there's kind of, of a, a pastoral element to the work that we do as organizers you think there's a little counseling that goes on maybe because uh, <laughs> well, it's think, the mental game right <laughs> yeah I mean I think it, it is there is some counseling involved in it, but it's not, I honestly, I don't think there's, it's therapy in the traditional sense. I think it's therapeutic, but mm -hmm. not therapy. You understand? Right. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that I realized is that if I could make someone feel good about themselves, I felt like I was actually contributing something in, right. in the world. If that one person feels better, then the people around them feel better, and then it just goes out like a ripple. So I decided to look into this organizing thing, because it took five years for me to realize that I was actually organizing. I didn't know what it was oh. before. <laughs> 
And when I was, I finally, I read the book that everybody reads, I don't even need to mention it, but I read the book and I went, oh my goodness, I've been organizing people, that's what I am, because I couldn't figure out what to call myself, I was right. like personal assistant, right. a hands-on helper, whatever, but right. finally it was like, oh my goodness, organizing, and there I went ahead and uh, decided to let my job leave me, and I finally screwed up my courage and went to a NAPO New York meeting in 2001. Mm -hmm. And when I went to the meeting, I realized I was with my people. <laughs> right. Would you consider at that time in 2001, you were still pretty much a newbie or had you been doing it for a few years, right? I, you know, it's funny. I had been doing it for a while intuitively. I, I would say that I'm a intuitive organizer. Mm -hmm. um, so every, I would do things thinking, well, listening to my gut, and I would follow that my gut. And over the years, as I've gotten more education, I realized that I had a way of doing things that there actually is a way, you know, it, well, there's a, a term for what I do. You know what I mean? Yeah, like right. coaching, I, I learned about coaching because I was curious about this whole thing called coaching and I realized oh that's what I do I coach people so I didn't feel like I had to become a coach because I already do coach do you, do you think anybody can get organized or do you think there's some people where it just you know it's a lost cause and they can't they couldn't do it well I I believe that everyone can get organized but I believe what the, the key to that is defining what organized means to you. Mm -hmm. So as an individual, I don't think organized means the same thing to everyone. Right. And I think as organizers, it's our duty to help that person articulate what organized means. Right. And um, so what may be organized to you is not organized to another person. Because I have to tell you, in every job, or in, when I've worked on a job where it's in a, a corporate environment, mm -hmm. Um, the person that I'm with or someone that's with the person I'm with always has to show me the most disorganized space, cubicle, office, whatever. Right. And I always ask, well, is this person, does this person feel overwhelmed? Are they not able to find the things that they need? And they always say, no, it's so weird. You ask for the what should we you know, whatchamacallit file, and then they go and they pull it out of the pile. It's crazy. And I say, <laughs> well, they have a system that's yeah. working for them. It doesn't work for you, but it works for them. Right. So, you know, it, and as I say all the time, I get that, um, oh, I know so-and-so. They really need you. And I say, well, someone may need me, but they have to want me, too. Exactly. Yeah, they got to have the, the motivation to do it. So describe what your first, like, maybe session is with a new client. Do you have... Uh, a questionnaire you go through or how do you kind of you know kind of like the doctor how do you assess what they're what they're uh, involved with and what they really need well it usually starts over the phone mm -hmm. and I have been able to um, over the years figure out a system where I send a few questions that it kind the questions aren't really to help me diagnose the person, but they're for them to think about the deeper part of the process uh, mm -hmm. that we're going to embark on if, if we're a good match. Um, so one of the questions is, if I were to wave a magic wand and you know everything, this issue were to be resolved, what would your life feel like, look like, be like, you know? And that is something that all the people that I when I speak to, they always say, when I think about that magic wand question, <laughs> I just, and it gets them going and thinking about what the possibilities are. Yep. Um, but then once they, we do that, then generally I go and do a, a, a formal assessment where I go and meet with them. It's a couple of hours. It's, it takes, um, there's an interview component, a tour component, and then we, it just organically happens out of that process that we kind of create an action plan for that uh -huh. person and identify things that work and um, will work for them. It's it's a fun process. I mean, I think it's people feel um, well. I've had it done to me, so I know. But <laughs> right. it's it's uh, one of those opportunities where you get to be seen as a whole person who has answers within you and without any judgment whatsoever and you know, that being seen without judgment is a gift that I give that person during the assessment. 
And now, now, do you do you go back and uh, like kind of remind people of it's kind of like their why? Let uh, me go back to the magic wand question and say, you know, remember when we first met? Maybe this is a couple sessions later. I mean, you told me this, and do you use that sometime to kind of keep them on track and remind them? I do that at every at, with every session. Okay. I mean, we because I think that we need to be reminded frequently especially in any process where we're looking for transformation or change you need to be reminded of why you're doing this because those right. are your motivating factors so I, I was with a client yesterday who um, ha has just completed uh, working on a film like just finished shooting a film and she she was you know we have created systems in her space and she was feeling very anxious and she hmm. said oh my goodness you know maybe you should come back really soon and and i just said we're you don't need me right now <laughs> like right. you just need to recover from this experience right. i'll see you in september because you know, she wants to work with me on an ongoing basis just to kind of right. keep her in check and together and i i realized that she she's trying to get back to what our original goals were but mm -hmm. we needed to just kind of get her back to a place where she could take a deep breath and then re transition and then move on to working with me on a regular basis so she feels more in control throughout the year but mm -hmm. it's not necessary you know what i'm saying it's right it's yeah. not necessary to constantly be organizing every single minute as long as you are working toward your goal and right. she was working Part of the reason why she was able to make this movie is because we made space for it in organizing her life. And then she got all creative and made a mess and wanted to put it back together. And we did that in a couple of hours. And, you know, she was back to where she had been a few months ago before she started this project. That's great. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about the the uh, the mental game of organizing when we come back. We're going to take a short break. We're with uh, Janine Sarna Jones from OrganizeMe.info, a professional organizer out of New York City, and uh, we'll be back talking with her about the mind game in a moment. Nearly one in every eight women in the U.S. will be diagnosed with breast cancer during their lifetime. While researchers work tirelessly to find new ways to fight this disease, a cure has not been found. Show your support for the fight against breast cancer with breast cancer awareness organizing products from Smead. A portion of the proceeds from the sales of specially marked pink products will be donated to support breast cancer research. Breast cancer awareness products include pink SuperTab file folders, stadium files, tag along mini organizers, and pink expanding wallets. Use the breast cancer awareness products from Smead to get organized and support breast cancer research at the same time. Smead, keeping you organized. We're back on Keeping You Organized with Janine Sarna Jones in New York City. And uh, Janine, uh, before we took the break, we were kind of uh, talking a little bit about you know that initial assessment you make uh, with a new client. You're talking about the, the why and the mind game. Uh, how, how do you kind of compare uh, like the tools of organizing versus the the mindset of organizing? Do you have a, a opinion one way or the other on you know if you just get the right tools you can do it or how how important does the mind game really play into it? I think it's a huge part. I think it's the vast majority. Um, there are some people I've met over the years who just it's just about the stuff and they just need to move it around mm -hmm. um, I know for me personally when I've been in a tough situation or I've felt like I needed a change moving things around and changing things around it does kind of do a mental shift mm -hmm. but to get to that point where you're actually ready to do it in in my clientele I would say a big piece of it is getting them to a place where they can see the possibility of having a change happen um, but I do know that there are people that where it's all about the stuff. Yeah, um, no, I'm sure when you go into a, a client, you know, they believe that they have uh, a very unique situation that no one else <laughs> has ever had in their entire life, right? What are yeah. what are some of the most common, you know, two or three things that you see from you know the chronically disorganized person that you know if they could just overcome a couple things, at least getting them headed in the right direction? What are some of the common things you see? Um, a few of the common things I see. Number one is like little technical errors where they block themselves from being able to 
do an action that would make things a lot easier. Like, for example, putting things in a closet. Instead, they put things in front of the closet mm. that they want to put into the closet. And, and you know, it's usually because the inside of the closet isn't, isn't a receptacle. Mm -hmm. It doesn't receive. It's more like a, a, a block. Mm -hmm. So, um, or in front of cabinets, that kind of thing. Um, is that maybe like something where you need to have some some rules in place because uh, you have the space, or you need to take the space and make the space more efficient? I mean, how do you kind of uh, uh, you know usually assess that? It depends on the person, but often it's because they have too much stuff, or they just aren't sure where to put it, mm -hmm. or they they don't they realize they think that it's a much bigger project than just a small task and in some cases it is a bigger project but to we have to fix the whatever the receptacle is the container yes. so that it can receive what you put into it if it's already full it needs um, or a door is stuck I mean that's it's stupid things like that I once had a client who had a cabinet next to her desk at, in her kitchen and the cabinet opened on the wrong side. So we just had a handyman come and turn the door around and open it from the opposite side. So when she was sitting at her desk, she could actually open the cabinet without getting up and moving around to the other side of the cabinet. So right. it's the things like that 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 um, can be that are just little technical things that can be fixed. Well, and sometimes people they don't think like that. They're so involved in the situation they think, well, this is the way it's always opened, right? You know, right. It's, I, yeah. I never thought about opening it the other way, but you, because you've been in different environments, you say, hey, you know what? We could we can take what we saw maybe somewhere else and say, hey, this is a very simple solution. So sometimes the solutions can be fairly simple to to uh, cause a a solution where someone's maybe been just overwhelmed because they hadn't thought of that particular thing. They're thinking, well, you know, I got to do this or this, but not that. Yeah, um, and I think what happens often is that people think that it's supposed, there's a certain way to do things. Mm -hmm. Like it has to be done. Like they're, if you're creating a filing system, it has to be in a drawer with file folders that are all lined up and it has to be alphabetical, you know, those kinds of things. And I, I don't think that way. Yeah, how do you, uh, like, say you're going to organize a, a, a file drawer for somebody, you know, they got a filing cabinet. Do you have a, a favorite way that you would set up an organization, or do you kind of try to assess with them, you know, how they it's might be thinking? It's all based on the way they think. It's okay. not, and, and if it's somebody, there are some people where literally a drawer is, there's a almost a visceral reaction that uh -huh. they have to putting things away in a drawer. I had one client who would, you know, we, worked on his filing system that a, an assist, a previous assistant had put together and I was trying to help him clean up the filing system um, so that he could use it himself mm -hmm. and he just would not use a filing system it was like he would put things on top but not it could not go in because it almost it was like he was putting it into a black hole and it was all in his head you know that it was going into a black hole so I created a filing system for him that was open and out and it was magazine boxes on a shelf nice and so he would he could see them and then and they were open and labeled and he knew where everything was but when his wife wanted people to come over she wanted it to look a lot nicer she would say okay i'm going to turn them all around yes yes <laughs> so that there's this nice smooth <laughs> exterior yeah. that that it w didn't bother her you know because they were in a shared space. So if they were entertaining, they could turn them around and people wouldn't really see all the papers and objects that were inside the file boxes. I, I had a similar situation like that when I started at Smeet. I, I didn't, I had never heard of the stadium file before, which, you know, is a desktop filing thing. And, yeah. you know, you always have three or four files you, you want to work with. And when I got a hold of that thing and I could put those files, you know, in a nice little small footprint on my desk, I was really excited. But so, <laughs> <laughs> one advantage to working here. But uh, yeah. um, well, let's talk a little bit back about you got involved in Naples. Then ultimately, you became the president of NAPO for several years in uh, New York City. Uh, tell us a little bit how that kind of happened. Well, when I went to my first meeting in May 2001, um, I joined right away. I volunteered July 2001, um, and I started off on a small job. And after that, it's just kind of you get sucked up, you know, mm -hmm. when you're <laughs> when you're somebody who's interested and committed to your community and wants to contribute, 
um, you just kind of get sucked up by other people who are feeling the same way. Mm-hmm. And I, I joined. I did a little job. Somebody asked me if I wanted to do a little bit more, and then I ended up being asked if I wanted to be on the board or run for the board. And I mm-hmm. became vice president, and I supported the president at that time. And then I became president, and then I of the chapter and that was an amazing experience and I then got elected to the national board of NAPO. Oh wow, that's great. Um, so, and I did a three-year term. Is that, uh, is, is, is NAPO, uh, it's, it's a very educational organization of course, but it's that camaraderie that kind of uh, comes from the other organizers. Do you kind of thrive on that? I do. I, I feel like the NAPO community is so supportive and warm mm-hmm. and because, you know, I I was recently talking to someone about, you know, the concept of competition between organizers. Mm. And the thing is that I got a lot of work over the years from other organizers um, because they saw that I was the right person for, for someone who came their way. Mm -hmm. Um, But they weren't the right person for, um, you know, I, I do the same when I meet someone or someone contacts me. Like just recently I got an email from someone who found me and he's in D.C., and I know wonderful organizers in, in the D.C. area. So I could give him three names to follow up with oh, right great. away because they're great people. Right. So and I know would, them well yeah. through NAPO. Yeah. You know? how, how would you describe your style then? You know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, clients looking around at organizers, um, you know, how would you describe what you do, what you excel at, you know, your sweet spot? Um, I would say my sweet spot is really uh, people who have a a mental block toward organizing, um, people who want to develop a practice of organizing and they're integrated into their lives. Um, I also am really good at helping people feel calm Mm -hmm. as I I come in and, you know, when people are up here and the energy is frenetic (laughs) and they're freaking out, you know, (laughs) I, I come in and I'm calm and relax. Calm down, yes, <laughs> nice. And that, yes, I help them bring it down and, and then they feel secure because I can make it work, whatever the situation is. And so I do I do some moving and relocation projects and, um, you know, helping people who are just have no idea where to start with a project like that, mm-hmm. I can make that happen. And then when people are freaking out because they feel like they don't have enough time, they're not working on what's most important to them, and they, they're, I just spoke with someone the other day, he's, he's um, just started a new business, he's going through a major transition, and he's not feeling like he's up to snuff, mm-hmm. you know, the standard that he set for himself, I'm really good at helping that person identify what the standard is, what, how we can help him reach it in a way that is healthy <laughs> rather right. than working you know 24 hours a day right right so if people so, want to get a hold of you uh, yeah if people want to get yeah. a hold of you uh your a website organize me dot info is that the best mm-hmm. way to reach you that's the best way to reach me yes right. absolutely Awesome. Well, uh, Janine, thank you so much for uh, the time today. And uh, I I think we'll be having you on again in the future because we just barely scratched the story here of uh, (laughs) of your organizing expertise and especially as we get into that, uh, the mind game thing. So uh, Janine Sarna Jones from OrganizeMe.info. And uh, thank you again for (laughs) joining us. Thank you.